Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. Head over to CanMedEvents.com now to learn all about our CanMed 2022 event taking place May 3rd through 5th at the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena, California. Quick programming note off the top, this will be the final episode for 2021. Our next episode will be January 5th when we welcome back CanMed 2022 keynote presenter, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. We hope you've enjoyed all the episodes this year. We've had some great ones. If you're new to the show or maybe missed a few episodes, please take this opportunity to go back and check out our previous episodes. It's evergreen content after all, which is perfect for the holiday season. All the previous episodes are available in all the major podcast apps and at canmedevents.com slash coffee talk. Of course, we hope that you'll stay connected with us on our social media channels. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. Also, I hope you'll join our CanMed Community Facebook group. The link to that is in the show description. And I hope you'll explore our CanMed video archive that includes all the videos of our past CanMed presentations. You can find that at canmedevents.com and the link is in the show description as well. And finally, give yourself the gift of a world-class cannabis education by purchasing your ticket to CanMed 2022 today. Head over to canmedevents.com to see our schedule, read about our speakers and their presentation topics, and learn all about what makes CanMed the cannabis conference you don't want to miss. This episode, we discuss outdoor hemp cultivation with Dr. Allison Justice. I do want to apologize for the audio quality on this episode. It seems we had an unreliable internet connection, and as a result, some of the audio got a little garbled. I don't think it'll be too distracting, and the information that Allison provides is great, so stick with us. Anyway, Allison is the co-owner and manages operations at the Hemp Mine, a 40-acre farm in South Carolina that manufactures consumer-ready products. The Hemp Mine currently produces a wide array of different products ranging from smokable flour to tinctures of all different concentrations for both humans and animals. The Hemp Mine also breeds regional trials indoors and outdoors at scale in order to offer validated hemp genetics to the hemp market in the form of stage 3 tissue culture, unrooted cuttings, and rooted cuttings, also known as liners, as well as clones. Topics we discuss include how the hemp boon that occurred after the 2018 farm bill helped and harmed farmers, research that universities are doing with regards to photo period, drying and curing, and more, how understanding a plant's specific photo period can be used to maximize yield, how using supplemental light outdoors can prevent flowering in semi-auto flower varieties, the importance of selecting hemp varieties that suit a regional climate, and how Hemp Mines Field Day helps educate new hemp farmers. Before we get to my conversation with Allison, I want to thank this episode's sponsor, Ten Buds, a site dedicated to all things cannabis with a special focus on growing and cultivation. Ten Buds is packed with fascinating and informative articles, resources, and reviews. Cannabis growers, enthusiasts, and business professionals alike can explore in-depth looks at everything from considerations for cannabis business owners to the evolution of marijuana's place in society, its health benefits, and so much more. Visit tenbuds.com to learn more. Okay, and without any further ado, I hope you'll enjoy my conversation with Dr. Allison Justice. Good afternoon, Allison. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Happy to be here. All right. So let's talk about hemp. You own and operate a farm in South Carolina called the Hemp Mine. Tell me about your operation and what got you started growing hemp. Yeah. So we are a vertically integrated hemp company. Um, do a little bit of everything from breeding to young plant distribution. Um, 
co-owners in an extraction facility, and we also have a consumer good product line. Uh, what got me into it? Um, honestly, it was a, uh, I, I suppose, a jump from marijuana. Uh, after I graduated uh, with my PhD, I uh, went out to California and worked in the marijuana industry for about three and a half years. And uh, being from South Carolina, where I am now, um, South Carolina came out with regulations to allow for growing hemp and my family being farmers, um, they got involved and, you know, eventually it just made sense to, to take some of the knowledge I learned out in California back home and um, take it away with, with CBD and CBG and all the other uh, cannabinoids that were allowed to grow under hemp production. Excellent. And now a few years back, a lot of people got really excited about the hemp industry with the passage of the 2018 farm bill. Um, of course that legalized hemp cultivation and many farmers, and it sounds like your family is one of them, switched their farms over to hemp or some you know, added hemp as a, a supplement to their traditional crops uh, to get in on the boom. So what is the state of the hemp industry now? And where do you see it in the next few years? Yeah. So, you know, that, that first year was a, a really big boom and, you know, a lot of people jumped in. Um, I think even the year after even more people jumped in. And so, you know, on one hand, it's, it's great, uh, you know, with the amount of people growing hemp, you know, people understanding it, not being scared of it, but at the same time, that initial jump was not great for the industry in a whole um, you know, it put a lot of biomass in the market, put a, a lot of people, you know, whether, whether they had, uh, you know, a, a positive mindset for being in the industry or not, um, they were there. And so there were a lot of people selling, you know, uh, seed that ended up being marijuana or, um, you know, forming these co-ops that they promised all of these farmers that, you know, we're basically on their last leg, this being their last hope to save the farm. And this huge co-op was going to put all these farms together and they were all going to be rich together and then, you know, did not shake out. Um, so, you know, a lot of horror stories came from it. A lot of people lost money. Um, some people have stayed in it and done well. Um, and so there, you know, there's, there's a lot of good and bad of it. You know, I think this first initial <laughs> kind of shake out uh, has really caused us the beginning of restructuring um, how hemp is and, and, and how it's grown and, and kind of, you know, the, the business model and the, the landscape that it should be in the U.S. And it, it's finally getting a little more um, legit, you know, a little more um, as any other agricultural industry um would and should be but it's it's been slow and a, and a hard road to get there but you know but besides that portion um you know the past few years have been extremely exciting i mean what we've learned about this plant and and what it can do has been incredible i mean just just for example um, i work very closely with clemson university and, you know, up until two years ago, you know, they didn't even want to hear the word hemp. Mm -hmm. And now um, I'm on grad committees with students who are able to use their host plant as or, or hemp as a host plant. Um, and just the amount of research they're putting out and just just in my little section of horticulture, you know, uh, vegetative production, flowering, that sort of thing, not even touching on fiber and uh, you know, the animal science, it, you know, everything else that can go mm. into it. just my little world of, of plant science has just exploded some of the effect from just our own customers. Uh, you know, th those are the things that I suppose keep us going, um, is that, that medicinal piece that yes, we really are helping people and, uh, you know, the industry kind of straightening out. Yeah. No, and you mentioned sort of the other uses for hemp, whether it be fiber or um, uh, the other ones that you've mentioned. So where, where do we stand right now? Is the lion's share of the market going towards CBD or cannabinoid production? Um, or are you seeing more, more farmers growing for fiber? You know, I think people want to. They, they desperately want to. 
Um, I think the infrastructure is on its way and on its way fast. Um, and I know there's a, a few spots that, um, you know, are either on, on their late stage of R&D, you know, ready to, to make, whether it's manufacturing or are growing um, commercial. Um, and then there are a couple in existence, but I think the demand of, of wanting to grow that type of crop versus having everything lined up as far as equipment, um, yeah. just to harvest and equipment to, to process it to fiber or, um, you know, whatever the, the industrial use there might be, um, is lacking a little bit. But, uh, you know, I think by next year, there'll be a good many acres grown for that uh, here in the U.S., Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm a believer that, you know, hemp fiber could be the future in a lot of different ways. It's just, it's, I'm just surprised I haven't seen it happen yet. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's, that it's right around the corner. You touched on research as well, and that a lot of the universities are now willing to, to do the research into hemp production. I was wondering, have there been some breakthroughs recently that, that you could kind of tell us about? And how can that research into hemp also apply to cannabis? So again, I'm going to go back to Clemson just because that's, you know, the, that's the group I work the closest with. I know, I know there's all sorts of great work going on medicinally and, and with fiber and, and animal feed and et cetera. But um, just with what I'm, you know, really closely privy to um, Clemson university and a, a good many others are doing some some really neat work into, um, you know, the, the, the physiology and um, direct application of science to help uh, flowering. And so what I mean by that is um, taking a hemp plant, uh, CBD dominant, um, and putting that in an indoor condition. So exactly what you would do with marijuana, you know, 100% minus you know, just being a different cannabinoid. And so, you know, they're, they're able to, you know, have these wonderful um, grow chambers and get really nitty gritty with everything from temperature to um, light intensity, light spectrum. Um, Clemson right now is really digging deeply in, which is one of my favorite things to study is uh, the drying and curing. And mm. so looking at, um, you know, what is, what is ethylene's role? Because, you know, in, in other horticultural fields, um, you know, whether it's storage of apples or storage of cut flowers, you know, we understand that backwards and forwards, we realize, you know, what, what sort of CO2, O2 is going out, you know, do we want ethylene there to ripen up a banana or do we want to pull ethylene out um, because it's making our cut flowers degrade and, and die very quickly and not be able to make it on the ship from, you know, Africa to, to wherever, um, you know, all of those really important things as far as plant science goes that we just have no idea how they apply to, to the cannabis plant. And so, um, you know, nothing published right now, but that's just some of the things that they're looking into and, um, you know, being directly uh, relevant to the marijuana industry. Um, you know, that's just some, some short examples, but, you know, the, the work that they're doing is, is very critical um, to the point where actually Dr. Faust and I, and so that's, that's who I, I work with very closely at Clemson. That's actually who I got my, um, my PhD under. Uh, he's a, a flowering physiologist. So he has spent his lifetime working with the flowering of poinsettia bridge, looking at um, unrooted cuttings and, and those being shipped across the US and you know how to keep those alive longer, um, how to preserve them. And so, you know, being being extremely relevant to marijuana or CBD production indoor. So basically any sort of smokable flower production. Um, you know, he's he's really grabbed hold of. And so um, uh, other industries. So let, let's say the the floor culture industry. 
Um, they have organizations where, you know, there's researchers that are really into research, which is immediately applicable to, to growing. So, you know, be able to increase efficiency or reduce labor costs, you know, whatever it may be that's applicable. Um, they form these associations. So for floor culture, it's the floor culture research Alliance. Um, you know, growers will pitch in a little bit of money to help support that research where they can just, you know, go, go deeper and harder um, with it versus only being able to get grants. And then those growers are able to take advantage of, of, you know, being first to the lineup to receive that information all through the year versus, you know, wait two years for a paper to get published. Hmm. Um, and so Dr. Faust, Clemson University and, and the Hemp Mine, we have formed a, a nonprofit called the Cannabis Research Coalition, um, where we are doing this exactly. So forming an association where growers, you know, vendors, people can join who really want to push research forward with, with the research, um, you know, knowingly really circulating around uh, smokable flower production and, and post-harvest and, you know, the, the, the factors of hemp that our skill set is really in. Um, and so that's something excited. We just launched, you know, a month ago um, and have had uh, a lot of interest. Um, and, and interestingly enough, a lot of interest from the marijuana industry, because, you know, like I said, it's it's all exactly the same and extremely relevant. So, um, yeah, it, it's really exciting. And I, I can't wait to see what what we'll be able to put out. Absolutely. I'm excited, too. And um, I think if there's room for a genomics company, uh, to be part of that coalition, I, I think I might be able to get you in touch with one. That <laughs> that would be absolutely. We would love that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I will definitely follow up on that. Um, another thing you you touched on that I want to come back to is um, drying and curing, um, and that sounds really interesting in a number of ways. But one from at least our perspective, medicinal genomics, we we do a lot of uh, microbial testing, and mm-hmm. how important is the drying and curing process and maintaining your, you know, maintain, making sure that your, your finished product is, is clean and, and free of any microbes, because I know I've, I've talked to other testing labs who have actually helped their customers, you know, pass yeast and mold testing, largely in part by looking at their drying and curing process. Oh, yeah, I, I think it may be the most important part. Um, you know, granted, you're not sp- Bring um, some sort of beneficial microbe the day of harvest. You know, granted, yeah. you're not doing that. Um, you know, I think it could be the the number one factor in in being able to pass those sorts of tests. Um, you know, again, reaching out into under other industries and and understanding how they uh, function and and use science to make healthy product. Um, you know, understanding your water activity. And, and how that influences, um, so, you know, basically water activity being the amount of water that's there available for microbes to, to grow and prosper, um, you know, understanding how to knock that water activity down fast enough um, to not allow for continual microbial growth, um, but at the same time, teeter-tottering that line where you're not drying it so fast to where right. you're losing all your terpenes. Yep. And so there's, there's definitely a fine line. Um, but in general, yes, if you, if you bake it, you know, dry it very quickly, immediately, obviously you're going to have the least risk of microbials. Um, but you know, uh, we can't do that. If, if we're growing for smokable flour, we need to, we want it to look and smell good. And so that, that requires, uh, you know, a, a different scenario, which, which we can achieve and we can achieve. Um, uh, but like you said, being able to, to really dig into somebody's drying and curing and, and even, you know, I, I kind of like to include it when I do work with, um, growers in their post-harvest, um, we don't just look at the day it enters the dry room. It's it's more of looking at um, specifically the last few weeks in the grow cycle. You know, what are you applying? What are you not applying? Um, you know, how are you watering? Are, are you watering with, you know, sprinklers from, not sprinklers, but the, uh, the types of emitters that kind of bubble up from the bottom? You know, yeah. are, are you still applying beneficial microbes through that? And it's actually 
aerosolizing to some extent, you know, all of those factors, um, you know, I like to look at. And then, of course, in the dry room, you know, how's your air circulating? Where's your where's your dead spots? Um, you know, where's your hot spots? Um, you know, all of those little factors are just are so invaluable when not only just producing a good quality smokable flower, but yeah, being able to pass those microbial tests. Yeah. And I gotta have to imagine that being in a climate like South Carolina, that's very humid, that's even even more of a consideration. And I guess sort of to that point, I I did watch an interview that you had done um, with another podcast when you were talking about sort of the regionality of, of hemp production and how, you know, you being in South Carolina and working a lot with cultivators sort of in the Southeast and talking about some of the special considerations that need to be taken for what region that you're growing hemp in. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, every, I'd say every month, <laughs> the importance of, of having a variety, if you're growing outside that, mm -hmm. uh, is conducive to that environment for one reason or the other is just, is so important. And so I'd say the, the two biggest factors, um, you know, with the, the most importance is one, the, the natural disease resistance. So, you know, in the Southeast, you've got really high humidity, really high heat, and just, uh, you know, a bountiful <laughs> natural uh, microbial existence of, of pathogens. <laughs> um, and, you know, with, with considering you, you cannot apply fungicides that, that are curative, let's put it that way. Um, uh, so being, you know, chemical synthetic pesticides, uh, fungus to the ground, having that natural population of pathogen there just ready to fight your plant, um, having some natural disease resistance in the variety that you're using um, is just night and day. I mean, we grow hundreds of different cultivars in our field every year. And I mean, it, it looks like we've done some sort of chemical experimentation because you'll see some rows that look like, you know, the burning bush, <laughs> you know, it looks like it's been completely burned where it's, it's a, it's a fungal pathogen that um, there's some varieties that it, no matter what you do, I don't care if you put the most expensive, uh, you know, beneficial fungus uh, fungal product out there on it every single day, it's not going to, it, it's not going to touch it. Um, and so breeding and selecting for those varieties, which can naturally ward off um, some of those problems is, is beyond important. Um, I would say the, the second most important factor, uh, especially considering, you know, being, being a vendor of the whole United States. Um, yes, we, we focus in, in the South, um, but, you know, understanding photo period. And mm. so, you know, a, again, working under um, a professor that, you know, his research revolved around poinsettias, you know, I got a, a really nice intro to that in grad school with another house plant, um, but understanding that photo period and, you know, being able to, to take advantage of what you're doing by understanding that per variety, um, it, it's just extremely special and, and important. And I think more important than many like to consider yet. Um, and so just to kind of give you an example of that, uh, we have one variety called Southern Sunset. And in the South, it does fantastic. It, it, fly, it, it initiates flower the latest meaning it has the uh, a shorter flower initiation time. So for example, uh, most varieties are somewhere around, you know, once, once the bell curve of, um, of time. So if you think about, um, oh goodness, you know, the apex of the summer where the days are the absolute longest, um, when it starts going back down, so we're going back into short days, once it hits a certain point, that's when a variety will flower. So most will flower when you hit about 14 hours. Um, sunset, on the other hand, it initiates at about 13 hours, 30 minutes. So that's only about a 30 minute 
time difference, but in reality, it's about a, a two and a half to three week difference. And so what that means is this plant initiates two to three weeks later, but then it also finishes two to three weeks later. And so again, in the South, that is wonderful. Um, It's starting to get cooler for that late harvest. Um, You can plant other ones in your field that, um, you know, will have that 14 hour photo initiation time. And so then you've got two weeks between your harvests. So, you know, you can harvest half of your Mm. crop, put it in the, the barn, dry it. Uh, clean the barn out and then do the other half of the farm. So staggering. Um, so it really helps save that, that time and labor there. Um, and so that's great. It, it's a great plant for the South, but because we've done trials in other areas, um, we understand, well, if you go, if you go above basically West Virginia and you grow this plant, you're going to be in trouble yeah. um, very likely because it is going to also finish late. It's going to grow well. It's going to look, you know, look just as good as it does in the South. But the problem is the frost sneaks up on you because of that late harvest. It, it's not able to get to its, its greatest maturity before it's killed by the frost. So, um, you know, that just being another example of why it's so important to, if your if your goal is to produce plants which grow outdoors in a, a wide range of environments and, and photo periods, um, you know, why do it? Yeah. So, so you're really taking advantage of the fact that you have a, a warmer autumn down there in the south by having this this plant that initiates flower much later in the season. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and especially as a, a hobbyist grower up here in the Northeast, definitely gotten burned before having things yeah. finish late and not even so much the frost, but we always seem to get battered with just cold, wet, raw um, type of days that just, I mean, Botrytis just loves yep. that sort of stuff. So exactly. <laughs> Um, so speaking of disease resistance, cause you did bring that up and you said that you select for disease resistance. Now, are you, um, intentionally inoculating these plants to see if they develop symptoms or are you just sort of putting them in the field and, and kind of letting nature do its thing? <laughs> so in the Southeast, uh, you don't need to inoculate anything. <laughs> I mean, if, if we're talking botrytis, um, southern blight, you know, some of the, some of those really common ones, you don't need to inoculate. You know, it, it's there. It's there yeah. and it's going to take down those plants, uh, which, you know, are either naturally unresistant or if if let's say you don't water them for four weeks or, you know, if 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 by your own fault you make the plant weak, it shows up as well. Um, but yeah, we, we don't really need to. <laughs> yeah. And, and going back to the photo period thing too, because I did, I did read about it on your website and I was kind of fascinated to hear it because of course the general rule of thumb with growing cannabis is, you know, in vegetative it's 18 hours of light. And then when you want to flip it to flower, it's 12 hours, but I was interested to hear that, you know, you know that, that 12 hour rule is not set in stone that it can be can be variable, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. That, um, that's perfect if you're inside and you know, all you got to do is flip a switch or, or set a timer, but nature has its, its own photo period. And it's, you know, we, we never get to that 18 hour time slot. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, where our varieties are, are nowhere near what we do indoors, but we do it indoors because it works. Um, that's not to say, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, that's not to say that that 12 and 24, 12 and 18, wherever it may be, um, you know, that's not optimized. You know, some of the work again, that they're doing at Clemson is showing, you know, again, how you can even indoors, how you can manipulate some of, of those metrics, uh, based off of a, a variety's response, you know, you can, you can have your plant take off a week um, to begin that flower initiation, or you can um, on certain varieties, you know, 
be able to apply 14 hours of light and that's during flower. And that's four, that's two more hours mm. that you could, you know, fill that plant full of photons. And so, um, okay. you know, it's, it's not just an importance understanding outdoors, but the, the indoor cycle too, really being able to maximize yields is, um, you know, I think we're going to get some some really funky rules and recipes to follow <laughs> in the next couple of years versus just the the twelve eighteen. Yeah, wow, that's that's really interesting. And when you said that, I, it reminded me of something else that I saw on your website was um, using supplemental light as a mm-hmm. way to sort of trick the plant uh, into not flowering. Um, do I have that right? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll let, yeah, I'll let yeah, you I know that, that's. That's right. So kind of opposite of sunset, you know, that's initiating flower um, at 13 hours. Uh, we have varieties that, you know, I've, I've termed as semi-autos because I don't really know what else to call them, especially in this industry and how we use certain terms, um, because it's not a true auto flower. because auto flowers, you know, it's, it's basically just a ticking clock. It's um, once it gets to 63 days, you know, whether the light's um, or at one hour or, or 24 hours, it's going to flower based on right. age, uh, meaning you cannot take clones from it. You can only reproduce it through seed. Um, whereas these flowers, um, you know, they truly are photoperiodic. It's just they have a really long initiation. Um, so th- in order for them to stay vegetative, they have to have 18 hours. Um, and so if you think about it, anywhere in the U.S. at any Mm. point of time, you're only ever going to top out at, what, 15, 15 and a half hours. And so, um, you know, if you if you are in a greenhouse growing this plant as stock, you keep it under 18 hours, you're you're able to to grow stock plants, you take cuttings from it, keep those cuttings above 18 hours. It's just like any other plant. But then you take that plant the, the, the liner and you plant it outside and it flowers, mm. you know, it gets to maybe a foot tall and it's done. And so, you know, you, you think, all right, well, maybe this is terrible. This is a terrible thing. Let's trash this variety. But if, if we, if we work this right, we can really take advantage of, of this knowledge around this plant and, uh, and, and do some really cool things. So, what some of my growers and, and ourselves at the hemp mine um, have done, um, I think our, our top semi-auto uh, selling variety is peach haze. Um, smells great. Um, you know, what we're able to do is in South Carolina, you know, basically May 15th, we can plant our first plant. And, and when I say that, I mean it because that's when the, the last frost test came. Um, you know, we can plant peach haze out there, turn on a floodlight from two sides. And as long as that floodlight's on, it'll continue to grow vegetatively. Mm. And so, you know, two, three weeks, however, you know, close or far away you want to space them, you cut that light off and then you're flowering. And so, you know, that's, that's really special and important because in South Carolina, um, we can do that three times in a season, um, you know, without the expense or annoyance of pulling shade cloth, building a greenhouse, you know, having a hoop house where you've got guys out there pulling cloth every single day um, and able to really maximize that growing season outside. Um, the other thing it's, it's really useful for is, you know, greenhouse growers. If, if you're an existing greenhouse grower, if you're wanting to put in a blackout system, it's just as expensive as basically, you know, <laughs> building in a greenhouse. It's, it's just about impossible. And so um, instead, you pick a different variety. You pick peach haze. Um, you know, you, you grow it just like you would any other plant, except you put maybe string lights, you know, just very inexpensive LED string lights a- across the row. You keep it, again, you keep it vegetated for couple weeks turn the lights off and you're flowering and you never have to pull shade cloth um and you can do that all year long because again you're never getting under 18 hours right so you're flowering right in the middle of summer Mm -hmm. wow that's great 
you know, and, and you touched on too, that it's great for, for you as, um, as a clone producer, as a nursery, um, because you're able to, unlike with auto flower, like you said, you can still take cuttings, um, and can still clone. So I think that's a nice segue to talk about, um, maybe seed production versus clonal propagation. Um, so I was wondering, I mean, and maybe we can start with you uh, kind of explaining from, from a business perspective, why did you decide that, you know, clonal propagation or selling clones is, is more, um, advantageous than, than being a seed producer? Yeah. Well, I guess a lot of things go into this answer. Um, <laughs> You know, first off, you know, if we go back to 2016 when when hemp was well, I'm sorry, when I was I guess 2016, I was playing with hemp in California under the, the marijuana rules. So, you know, when I'm when I'm playing with hemp, um, you know, you can look at it a few ways. One, if you're a marijuana grower, you know, how how are you propagating? It's usually from clone. Sure. And, and what's the reason for that? Well, because we want high consistency. Mm -hmm. um, we want ease. We don't want to have to pheno hunt. Um, th there's, a, there's a million reasons that I could go on and on. Um, you know, at, again, at the beginning of, of when hemp really got going, the, the price, whether you were growing just for isolate or, you know, the, the, uh, let's, say, let's say the product you would get the least return on, whatever it was, the price was still that um, clones were, were, were achievable. You were going to meet your ROI. Um, the other thing I would like to add to that and, and is very important, and I feel like from, from your point of view, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, how long have we been breeding mm. hemp? Um, you know, being from the horticulture industry, you know, it for just a petun a new petunia to be released, you know, it could take eight years, right. <laughs> you know, to breed it, to be confident in it to send it around to uh, different regions to do trials and understand the data and then be able to guide your customer on how to grow it to the, to the greatest extent and then them do well and want to order from you again. Um, and, you know, going back to that first year, there's seed producers where in the world they came from. I don't know, <laughs> um, you know, popping up saying that they're home based in North Carolina and uh you know, uh, giving out genetics that are, are, are crushing people, you know, are not doing what they say or, you know, have 4% THC in it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've had time since then. And, and there are some, um, you know, legitimate seed companies out there now um, that have had time and um, time to, to not only help homogenize their seed lines, but time to, to help themselves understand where those varieties can grow best. Um, so in, 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 in short, it takes time to grow a really nice homogenous line of any plant. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, between those two reasons, it made a lot of sense to breed, select, and, and find those clones, those, uh, those vegetative plant materials that, you know, I could be extremely confident in you know, be, be able to, you know, lead my customers down a path of success, whether that's, you know, this is when you're, no matter where you're at, you give me your zip code and I can tell you when this plant's going to initiate mm -hmm. and when you should get it tested and when you're not, you know, at, at what point you're going to go hot, what diseases, you know, will, will you struggle with, you know, every single detail for success that, you know, I was able to do that by understanding the plants I was working with, which would only happen at this point in time um, through clonal lines. Um, you know, that's not to say that I don't believe that for, for oil production, um, that seed is, is not the future if, if it's not the now. Um, you know, if, if you are, are struggling to get $200 per kilogram of isolate, it probably makes sense to grow seed. And if there's a little bit of variability between, you know, six and 12%, or if they don't look exactly the same, or if they have, let's say a stagger of, of two weeks 
finish time. You know, maybe it doesn't matter because you're just going to chop them all down with a tractor anyways. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the, the market that we're really approaching and, and, you know, customers that, that we work with are, are the ones which are growing for smokable flour. Um, many of them now this past year and, and especially coming up this current year, um, you know, they're growing for terpene production. Hmm. And so, you know, the, the variability in seed with terpene production is also there. Um, and so if you're growing for terpene production, you want every single plant to, to basically have that same terpene profile. And so, you know, again, with the, the return on terpenes being much higher than, let's say, isolate, you know, they can afford a little bit higher plant cost. And it makes a lot of sense because their quality at the end there is going to line up, be all the same, um, and and be able to to get a good price point for it. Excellent, yeah, glad to hear that. You know, terpene, the terpene market is flourishing. Um, it is always it's always good to hear. Um, so winding down here, I did want to give you an opportunity to talk, or I did want to ask you about uh, the field day event that your your team puts on um, because I think it's a great educational event. Um, where people get to get to actually experience the plants that you're producing and and really see how things uh, um, are performing in the field before they purchase it. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that and um, why you believe it's it's so important. Yeah, so it, it's my I guess you'd say most stressful but favorite time of the year. Um, <laughs> I know, you know I know the feeling. We put on the conference every year, and it's yeah. very much the same way. <laughs> Exactly. You look forward to it and you're like, oh, but uh, no, it's, it's something that I, I really love doing. And I, I, you know, from the get go, I saw value in, but year after year, you know, really seeing, um, seeing how it's shaped out and the value that it's brought to other people has, has been very in, endearing. Um, but what we do is we host, it's usually a, a two day field day. And so I was saying earlier, um, you know, we always send out our new varieties, old varieties to, to very different regions of the U.S. and, and collect our data that way. Um, South Carolina being our, our home base, um, you know, we, we do our own variety trial. And so, um, you know, brand new varieties, existing varieties, Pheno you know, hunts, um, you know, we, we have just about, you know, <laughs> as many plants there in, in a, uh, a 30 acre plot than maybe some states have. It's, it's really cool. And <laughs> the testing costs are outrageous, <laughs> yeah, I believe it. <laughs> but it, it's totally worth it. And it, it is such a treat getting to, to see them um, uh, change over time. And, you know, version three of cat daddy, let's say, uh, come down the line. But anyways, we, we plant those out. Um, we invite the public, uh, farmers, everyone out to see it. Um, and, and really the goal there is to, you know, allow a farmer who is unsure, you know, whether they want to plant cedar clone, whether they want to work with us or another company, you know, whether they even want to get into hemp. Um, we try to provide guidance, uh, education, and show them, you know, if you're looking for smokable flour, you know, this is what the expectation is. You know, here are varieties which that which fit that demand. If you're looking for, um, I don't know, a purple flower, you know, here's our segment of, of purple flowers. Um, and, and really allow a, a farmer to see and touch and feel with his own eyes before putting in a purchase. You know, it's it's getting better and better, but you know, the days of, of just being thrown one COA um, and a picture yeah. and saying, this is how it's going to go, you know, yeah. send me $20,000, you know, that's, that's just not good enough. You know, people being able to come out and look at it is, uh, is highly important. And then on top of that, we have, um, you know, I, I get up there and talk about all of our new introductions. Um, you know, I, I talk about some of the contract research we do. Um, so, you know, within within our variety plots, um, we'll do research. So this year, one big one was with Promix. They're a mycorrhizae company. Mm -hmm. And so 
um, you know, having treatments with them um, with different varieties and, you know, being able to show the farmer that and show them the difference and what to look for. Um, and then ProMix being there on site where if they do have any questions, you know, they can talk to their technical rep. And um, so it's a little bit of a, you know, a mini trade show, I, I guess you could say with, yeah. you know, about eight different vendors, ones that I, I use and would trust um, to come and, 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 you know, discuss everything from soil to zero tall. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's a good time. And then this year we had Dr. Faust come out and, and give a, a lowdown of what he's got going on there and on campus greenhouses. So no, it's, it's a fun thing we do every year and, um, we'll keep doing it. So yep. Next, next fall. Come and see All us. right. No, I think, I think it's a great, a great re resource because as we said before there's a lot of people getting into the hemp industry and it's hard to find good guidance and good information so the fact that you're you're providing that for them is is fantastic and of course it aligns with kind of our mission here at CanMed as well and and to that point please do let us know when the next field day is we'd be happy to spread the word to our audience yeah. and try to get some people down there um all right. So with that wrapping up, I know I've, I've taken you over the time, um, but I've just enjoyed talking with you a lot. So um, wrapping up, if you have any social media or website or anything to plug to uh, help people get in touch with you or additional resources that you think would be beneficial for people to read up on, uh, please do share. Yeah. So please check us out. Uh, our website is just the hempmind.com. Um, we also have a YouTube page where we get super nerdy and, and talk deeply about <laughs> photo period and, and, awesome. uh, you know, field maintenance and care, et cetera, et cetera. We try to update it pretty regularly with, with things that are, are, you know, directly useful for, for farmers and producers, um, check out our Instagram and Facebook, um, it's just the handles at the hemp mine. And, um, of course, reach out to me with any questions. My email is allison at hitmine.com. All right, Allison. It was really great talking with you. And uh, I hope I get to see you out in Pasadena for Camden. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Allison Justice. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, 10 Buds. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, this will be our final episode for 2021. And our next one will be January 5th when we welcome back CanMed 2022 keynote presenter, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. In the meantime, I hope that you will stay connected with us on social media, join our Facebook group, and check out the CanMed archive. And of course, if you haven't yet bought your tickets for CanMed 2022, do it now, and we look forward to seeing you out in Pasadena this spring. Okay, in closing, we hope you have a safe and happy holiday season, and we hope you'll join us for the next CanMed Coffee Talk.